There's an old saying that declares, money isn't everything. But for some people, money is the only thing. And those people will go to great lengths to grab as much money as possible from any source available. In this story, a woman arrives in a small town and meets a generous older man. The man is a wealthy business owner and veteran who invested wisely in the stock market throughout his life. My Uncle Vern was one of the greatest, nicest guys I've ever met. Vern was a veteran from Lynchburg, Ohio. He grew up in the farming industry, but decided early in his life that he did not want to be a farmer. At 23 years old, he moved to the town of Shamokin, Pennsylvania. Vern saw the potential for business in the town and loved the beauty of the mountains. As he grew up in Southern Ohio, the most he ever saw was a hill so the picturesque scenery took his breath away. Vern opened up a business called the Shemokin Equipment Company to help furnish the homes, bars, restaurants, and hotels in the area. His business offered every and any item for home or bar from kitchen appliances to air conditioners. Vern always sold the most up-to-date styles and his company did well. Then Vern began learning about the stock market and the best way to invest his money. He was very frugal and he kept just enough money for his daily needs while investing the rest in the market. He also invested in some real estate in town, buying a three-story apartment building. He chose to live on the third floor where the view was better and he rented out the two lower floors. Eventually, Vern owned a list of stocks that represented every letter of the alphabet. Letter A stood for his AT&T stock, of which he owned a whopping 10,500 shares. He soon became a multimillionaire. Vern enjoyed his wealth and dated many ladies for different amounts of time. Whenever a romantic relationship ended, Vern always remained friends and stayed in contact by phone or an occasional dinner. At one point, he was deeply in love with a woman in Shemokin and wanted to marry her. He even joined the local country club to get closer to her. Unfortunately, her father didn't like Vern and that rejection ended the couple's relationship. Vern, now in his 70s, continued to run the Shemokin Equipment Company while investing in stocks. One afternoon, a woman visited Vern's business to look into equipment she needed to redecorate the local hotel. Let's call the woman Rima. Vern helped Rima and gave her access to everything she needed. Hello, miss. Uh, welcome to Shimokun Equipment. How can I help you today? I need the furniture. All righty. For your home? Uh, no, I am redecorating a hotel. The place is a dump. Okay, well, I've got a big selection of tables and chairs, bar stools, anything you need. I don't want anything cheap, so... The owner is paying. I don't really care how much it costs. We can charge him for whatever I buy. Okay, well, you should probably buy the best items for the needs of the hotel, not just the most expensive items. The best items are the most expensive ones. He's paying, so let's charge him a lot of money. Okay. Well, let me show you what I have. After their first encounter, Rima befriended Vern, and they go out to dinner where he learned more about her. This place is nice. Yeah, I think it's the best steakhouse in town. So, tell me about yourself. Where are you from? I was born and raised in Lebanon. From when I was a girl, I always wanted to have money and be somebody. I got married to a mean man who hit me all the time. He forced me to get a job and earn money. I'm sorry, I may have to interrupt here sometimes. Her husband wasn't abusive. Rima actually wasn't satisfied with the money he earned, and she chose to work and try to earn more. Well, he sounds like a real jerk. So what did you do for work? I, uh, I, I worked in a restaurant. What kind of restaurant? Uh, a steakhouse restaurant. Actually, she was a lady of the night. She learned all the tricks of the trade and had other girls working for her. Her business venture was short-lived as local police discovered the illegal activity. Luckily for Rima, 
Someone informed her of the upcoming raid, and she took all her money and any belongings she could carry to the local port. From there, she sailed off to the Venezuela, where she had a few relatives. I decided to go to Venezuela, and then I uh, went to Mexico. That's a lot of traveling. Uh, what did you do in Mexico? I worked at the border with the Red Cross. I was good with people. The Red Cross in Texas gave me a green card to help them. It was a six-month visa. Then I decided to take a bus and live in Pennsylvania. Oh, so you traveled from Texas to Shemokin? Yeah, I went straight to Shemokin. Why did you choose Shemokin? I, uh, I liked the name of it. <laughs> so here's the truth. Rima's visa expired and she bought a bus ticket headed east with the hope of getting lost in the huge population of New York City. She didn't make it to New York, though. She ran out of money by the time she reached Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. You know what? Let me take it from here to explain her time in Pennsylvania. In Harrisburg, Rima took a job as a waitress in the local restaurant. She befriended a young man named John, who ate lunch at the restaurant every day, and the two were married not long after. The marriage lasted one month as Rima left John because he didn't earn enough money for the lifestyle she wanted. She headed north on a bus, and John never saw her again. He was granted a divorce a couple of years later. Rima landed in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, and began working in the kitchen of a local hotel. Her job afforded her both a room and food. The situation was perfect, but she and the married hotel owner started an affair. When the owner's longtime wife discovered her husband was cheating, Rima was asked to leave. Rima wasn't leaving quietly, though. She threatened to publicly expose the owner's infidelities, so he offered her $15,000 to leave town. Rima was gone by the end of the day. For her next stop, Rima traveled to Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, where she was hired to work in cold food storage at a hotel. Meanwhile, the local hotel in the nearby area of Shemokin was struggling and in need of help with reservations. The owner of the Jefferson Hotel then hired Rima to help cook and put the hotel on the map. She would end up doing more than that. She lived in the hotel, ran the kitchen and dining room, and started working on redecorating the establishment, which takes us back to how she met Vern. In case you're wondering how I know all Rima's backstory, I'll explain that later. Over time, Vern and Rima continued to have more dinners and got more acquainted. At one point, though, Rima became angry with Vern when he refused to let her buy her hotel needs on credit. I want to buy all this furniture on credit. Credit? Uh, Rima, I'm not comfortable with that. Why not? Don't be a pain, Vern. I don't accept credit. I never have. What? You're being stupid. Uh, Rima, you're not being logical. Give me what I want. No, I can't do that. You're being an idiot. Even without her furniture on credit, Rima continued to help popularize the Jefferson Hotel in her own way. She added upstairs card games for men, where she served them drinks and dessert. Conversations eventually started around including more than dessert. Rima suggested adding girls to the evening card games, something she had past experience in. Rima went into town and recruited girls, mostly teenagers, to attend the evening events. She would approach girls on the street. Hey, do you need money? Are you looking for a job? I can pay you a lot of money to come work at my hotel. Come with me. I'll give you a job. Prostitution in small towns is more common than people think, and it's often underreported. In the Journal of Sociology and Social Work, there was a report on prostitution in rural counties. After interviews with law enforcement and social workers, the report mentions, quote, our data hints that prostitution may be far more common than official statistics suggest. The report also details that often prostitution in rural areas can be an economic strategy to deal with unemployment and poverty in the region, but it can also be related to drug use. With some of the girls in the town working in the hotel, money started rolling in. Rima more or less served as the position of a pimp. 
Generally, pimps are men who control prostitutes and arrange sexual encounters while taking some of their earnings. Rima positioned herself as this type of nefarious agent. Some of the prostitution money went into the hotel cash register, but most of it went into Rima's purse. Meanwhile, the owner of the hotel now had several new business ventures, and he moved his family away from Shimokin. He still visited the hotel when he could, and one afternoon, he noticed a young woman leaning up against the side of the building. He asked what she was doing there, and she replied, I work here. Are you looking for a good time? The owner told the girl to leave, and he ran into the hotel to find Rima. Curious, he fired Rima and ordered her to get out immediately. Rima snapped and started swinging, but didn't land any punches. She gathered her belongings and left the hotel, but not before giving the owner a piece of her mind. I made this hotel big. I made a lot of money for you, you stupid f***ing idiot. F*** you. I don't care if I use girls to bring in customers at works. You are going to f***ing pay for this. You'll see. F*** you. Rima broke into the hotel that same night and washed her clothes in the kitchen sink. The next morning, the owner found her sleeping on the banquet table with her clothes drying off. The owner called the police who removed her from the building. She then reached out to Vern and fabricated a story about abuse at the hotel. What happened exactly? The owner, he beat me up. He abused me. He punched me in the face. Well, luckily, it doesn't look like he hurt you at all. You don't have a black eye or any bruises. Oh, no, I mean, he punched me in the stomach. Wow, that's terrible. I need to sue him, but I don't have any money. Oh, I can let you use my attorney and you can pay me back when you get back on your feet. What? I'm already on my feet. It's an expression. You can pay me back when you have money again. Okay. Vern wasn't usually a fan of just giving people money. He would always be open to lending money to anyone who asked, but he expected to be paid back. He disliked freeloaders who used people for money, but he would give people money in certain circumstances. At one point, his friend's mother needed surgery, and Vern gave him the money without question. That wasn't cheap. Vern's kindness, though, could be taken advantage of, and Rima was becoming well aware of this fact. Vern's attorney soon recognized Rima's abuse story for what it truly was, and he suggested she find another lawyer. Rima not only lied about abuse, she accused the owner of the hotel of being complicit in the prostitution. It took the owner 10 years to fight her in court, and after one of the girls confessed that Rima was lying, the owner finally won his case, ending his nightmare. Meanwhile, Rima asked Vern for help with a place to live. Vern was very patriotic, though, and refused to rent one of his apartments to someone who wasn't a tax-paying citizen. Vern, you have an apartment building. Let me live in one of the apartments. Rima, I can't let you live there if you aren't paying your share in taxes. Taxes? I already left taxes. Who cares about taxes? Give me a place to live. Uh, no, not taxes. I'm talking about paying your... Just let me reach out to my friend, Betty. Who's Betty? She's my friend. She might have a place for you. Good. Reach out to Betty. Byrne contacted Betty, who owned a large home with spare rooms. Betty agreed to let Rima rent a room. Not long after, Rima started to notice Vern's possessions. Vern owned a nice car, and he generally dressed well. Once a year, he would travel to New York and buy silk ties and monogram shirts. Rima soon realized that Vern was wealthy and had no family in Shemokin. That's when Vern became her new target. Vern, you don't have any family in Shemokin. No? No, most of them are in Ohio. Huh. I saw you have a nice car. Thanks. It's a Cadillac. My favorite kind of car. I think they're really well made. Expensive? Mm, yeah, it's not a cheap car. Vern, do you have a lot of money? Huh. I don't like to talk about those things. You spend money in the stock market? Oh, yes. I love investing and finding great stocks. You can teach me? Sure, I can give you some tips. Make me rich like you. 
<sighs> After realizing Vern was wealthy, Rima then noticed that he paid a couple to clean his apartment, and she decided to try to take their jobs. The closer she could get to Vern's money, the better. Vern, those people that clean your apartments do a bad, bad job. Really? They always seem very efficient to me. No. I am more efficient. Hire me to clean and I'll cook for you too. You know I am a good cook. Well, I wouldn't mind a hot meal. You can give me money each week and I'll buy you food. Okay. I'll pay you once a week and give you money for my groceries. Yes. Hire me. All right. Outside of Vern, the people of Shimokan weren't welcoming to Rima. Some folks were just racist and didn't like her accent, while others were aware of her misdeeds and prostitution at the hotel. She still determined, though, to get something out of any of the small-town folks that she can dupe. She already victimized the hotel owner, some of the girls in the area, and was working on Vern, but there was more bilking to be done. Next up were the generous and kind folks of Shimokan. As Rima was now settled in Betty's home and working for Vern, she devised a plan to get her sister and two nephews into the United States from Lebanon. Rima started to cry around certain people in town who then offered to console her. She complained about missing her family and being unable to afford to bring them to the U.S. As more people around town heard her story, a group of them decided to help and gathered a fund. Betty agreed to renovate the upstairs of her home where Rima lived, adding a kitchenette and another bathroom. The people in town used the fund to pay for the construction, and when complete, Rima's sister and her two sons arrived in town and moved in. The boys then enrolled in the local high school. Vern had a soft spot for the boys and agreed to help out. Rima would help out in her own way. She took half the food that she purchased for Vern each week, using his money, of course, and gave it to her sister and nephews. Have you seen my cereal? No. What about the milk? Didn't you just go shopping? You drank it all. I don't think so. You don't remember. I don't think you bought any. You're just confused, Vern. I'm not confused. Enough! When Vern turned 78 years old, he decided to finally sell his business to a loyal employee of 17 years. Vern no longer had the stamina to run the business in the way he demanded of himself. The Shimokan Equipment Company was now under new ownership. At this point, Vern's eyesight was failing, and he had several minor car accidents, which sent his insurance skyrocketing. Rima offered to be his chauffeur. If Vern needed to depend on her for transportation, she would have even more control over him. She, of course, needed to learn to drive first. Vern, I should drive you around. You can't drive good anymore. Mm, yeah. My eyes aren't what they used to be, but you don't even know how to drive. So find someone to show me how. Let me see what I can do. Find someone, Vern. So another request from Rima for Vern, who was kindly accommodating as usual. His friend in the police department agreed to teach Rima to drive, and she received her license. She then offered to drive for Vern, but she also wanted more. Okay. I have my license now, so I can drive you. That's really great. Congratulations, Rima. You need to let me move in now. Move in? Yes. Uh, you want to live with me? Yes, let me sleep on the couch. Well... Yes. Um... Yes? Okay. Yes. At this point, Rima had wormed her way completely into Vern's life by taking advantage of his kind nature. He depended on her for food, transportation, and now she was literally in his home, which gave her access to him and his possessions 24-7. While living in Vern's home, Rima asked him again to give her advice about the stock market. Vern, what stock should I buy? Well, you should look for companies that you think have a real future. What companies? You have to research and read about them. Communication companies are good. Everyone needs to communicate. But what company? I've made money from AT&T stock. Okay, I'll buy that. Well, it's an expensive stock. You need to spend a lot of money to buy anything substantial. Okay, I'll spend a lot of money. I'm not sure you have enough. I'm talking thousands and thousands. Don't worry, I have money. Rima then began buying her own stock using Vern's money and any of his guidance. 
she discovered the combination of his safe, and in it he had $95,000 in bearer bonds. Rima took one bearer bond worth $5,000, assuming Vern would never notice. He never did. She had no clue what to do with the bond, so she reached out to a local attorney. She lied and said that Vern gave it to her and asked how she could cash it. She then deposited the bond into her bank account. A bearer bond is a physical certificate with coupons attached that are used to redeem the interest payments. As the ownership is not registered, the owner of a bearer bond is simply the person in possession of it. Because of this, bearer bonds are as vulnerable as cash to being stolen. Bearer bonds are now virtually extinct in the U.S. because the lack of registration made them ideal for use in money laundering, tax evasion, and in this case, theft. Over the next several years, Vern unfortunately suffered constant loss of family. First, his nephew passed away. Two years later, his brother-in-law passed away. And two years after that, his sister passed away. Nevertheless, Vern still enjoyed calling and seeing his remaining family on holidays. One summer, my mom and my family visited Vern in Shimokan. He welcomed us with open arms and a big smile. He pulled pictures of our children from his desk drawer and named each one of them. That's Kristen. There's Michael. His name's Jeff. Hello. Ah, Rima. This is my housekeeper, cook, and driver, Rima. Hello. Nice to meet you. Come eat. I have dinner for everyone. Rima seemed kind, and she prepared a delicious dinner for us. She was a very good cook. Vern was in good spirits, and he sang an Irish song in his beautiful tenor voice. Just two years later, Vern was unfortunately aging quickly, both physically and mentally. He had trouble walking and could only climb the stairs to his apartment once a day. On Vern's 90th birthday, our family visited him in Shimokan. We asked Rima if we could invite some of Vern's friends, but her response was that they were all either dead or just wanted his money. After our visit, I mentioned to Rima to please contact us if he was ever in need of anything at all. Six months later, Vern entered the Shimokan Hospital. No diagnosis was confirmed, but the first doctor who examined him thought it was the flu. My mom and I wanted to see Vern, so we called Rima. Hello? No, don't come to visit. Vern is back from the hospital and doing better anyway. Don't come here. Whenever we called to speak with Vern, Rima gave an excuse. Hello? No, he can't talk. He's sleeping. I don't want to wake him. Hello? No, he can't talk. His teeth are out. He's embarrassed. We kept calling and calling Vern, but received no contact from him. Rima was definitely trying to get us out of the picture. After many unanswered calls, Rima finally called back and informed us that Vern was in the VA hospital in Washington, D.C. Rima purchased an expensive home in nearby Alexandria and traveled there every weekend. At this point, Rima's sister and nephews moved to Philadelphia, where the boys started college. With practically no contact from Rima, my mom and I decided to drive to the VA hospital in Washington to find out what was going on. When we arrived at the hospital, we were informed that Vern was no longer there and that they were unaware of where he currently resided. We asked the hospital to reach out to Rima to find out where Vern was located. Hello? Where's Vern? Who's asking? No, don't tell them where he is. With Rima refusing to give us Vern's location, we called around to local nursing homes to see if we could find him. We eventually did on our fourth try. We made arrangements with the nursing home to see him. When we visited Vern, he looked unhealthy and unfortunately couldn't remember who we were. Oh, hi. Uh, thanks so much for visiting me. I, I can't recall your names right now. Where, where do I know you ladies from? After about 10 minutes, Rima came bursting in. Oh, you should have told me you were coming. I would have made a party. I take the two of you to lunch. We agreed and accepted her insincerity. During lunch, Rima discussed a new will that Vern supposedly wrote but hadn't signed yet. Rima mentioned that she's waiting for Vern to have a lucid day so he could sign the new will. Vern said he needed to change his will. He thought it was old and it needed to be more new. But after he wrote it, he forgot to sign it. 
I'll make sure he signs it when he remembers again. Attempts to forge wills center around three strategies. First, there's the invalid signature, where the person photocopies, traces, or handwrites the person's name on the will. Second, there's the invalid witness, where either a fake witness is used or their signature is forged as well. Third, there's the lack of capacity, where the will is signed by the person, but they are not of sound mind for it to be legal. After lunch, Rima gave us a tour of her luxurious Alexandria home. She spent $400,000 of Vern's money on the home. We learned that the cost just for the landscaping in the backyard was $35,000 a year. She spoke about how she cared for Vern when he got sick and put him in the car with a pillow under his head and a blanket because he wanted to go to the VA in Washington. Rima then drove us throughout Washington, D.C. She said that Vern wanted a new car, so she traded in his Cadillac for the most current model. As he was stuck in the nursing home, it didn't make any sense that he even cared about a new car at that point. She drove way too fast and came within inches of hitting other cars. I can't imagine poor Vern having to endure her insane driving. After the white knuckle driving tour, Rima dropped us off at our motel. Before exiting the car, Rima explained the current money situation. Vern and me, we have lots of money. Just tell me how much you want to go away, and I'll write you a check or give you a stock. My mom and I were infuriated by this offer. I informed Rima that we have never asked our uncle for money and never will. We exited the car, slamming the doors. Rima then tried again to offer Vern's money to my mom. How about you? Just tell me how much you want. There is greed in everybody. My mom looked her in the eyes and explained, well, there's not greed in me. Rima began to drive off, then slowed down to look at us in disbelief. After realizing we weren't changing our minds about taking any money, she sped away. We told Rima that we were heading home the following day, but instead decided to return to the nursing home the next morning to fully evaluate what was going on with Vern. We entered Vern's room and found him sleeping. As soon as I said his name, his eyes opened wide and he smiled. The orderly entered and I asked if Vern could be brought into the visiting area. The orderly opened nearby drawers so Vern could get dressed, but we discovered he had no clothes. The orderly said that Vern could borrow some from his roommate like he has in the past. Vern also didn't have any glasses to see with or teeth to eat with. We were furious about Vern's lack of care and wondered how cruel can Rima be to this man who always helped her. After Vern was brought into the visitor's area, we started to speak with his doctor. We informed the doctor that we were relatives from out of state and that our uncle was ill and being taken advantage of. The doctor interviewed Vern, who was confused by his questions because of his progressing Alzheimer's disease. We told the doctor that Vern needed a guardian to start looking out for his best interests. I asked the doctor to write up a document about Vern's needs in order to show something to an attorney or judge. The doctor agreed and wrote a message about Vern's condition. We thanked the doctor and returned to our attention to Vern. We took Vern in his wheelchair over to the window and pointed out some puppies playing nearby. He smiled and acknowledged the puppies. We eventually leave and Vern was placed next to another gentleman he befriended at the nursing home. The following day, we traveled to Shimokan to attempt to become the legal guardians for Vern. Rima was contacted and informed of our plans a month later, Vern was suddenly violently ill and vomiting at the nursing home. The doctor explained to us that Vern had some sort of fluid in him that was making him sick, but no one could figure out the cause. Vern was placed on a ventilator, and 10 days later, he sadly passed away. I think it may have been arsenic poisoning, but I have no proof. Vern always wanted to leave most of his estate to charities and the poor, but we discovered that Vern's new will that he supposedly signed, now gave all of his money and property to Rima. We didn't buy this for a second and decided to contest the will. The doctors at the VA hospital wanted to have an autopsy performed on Vern, but Rima had control over his body via the will and adamantly refused. Our attempt to contest the will was a long process that took nine months. We won in the lower court, but then had to fight Rima's appeal. 
Our attorney hired a detective to investigate Rima, so that's when we discovered her extensive, sordid history that I detailed earlier. During the time we were battling Rima in court, she spent all of Ern's money on land in Virginia. She bought a farm for $865,000, a building for a million dollars, which she named the Rima Building, and 20 houses throughout the state. We finally won our contest of the will, but at that point, Rima had spent any money Vern had left. Eventually, though, all of Rima's properties were foreclosed. She had a problem making payments. So long, Rima Building. Rima said in the past that she wanted to have money and be somebody. Well, she got her money, but the only somebody she became was an opportunist who stole a kind old man's fortune and built the generous people in a small town. Anyone Rima met was always left worse off after she took anything and everything she could from them. She took advantage of anyone kind or generous, and people like her are the reason there's a cynical saying, no good deed goes unpunished. Even though Vern has passed away, my family and I won't stop fighting for his memory. Vern never wanted to allow freeloaders into his life, but as he aged and mentally declined, his defenses were unfortunately down. I hope his story serves as a cautionary tale to people in the future who may have a similar situation with a loved one. There's sadly a Rima in every town, and the good people out there need to watch out for the bad people like her. Allegedly is a production of Voyage Media. The series is produced by Nat Mundell, Robert Midas, and Dan Benamore. This episode, When the Time Comes, I'll Know, was written, produced, and directed by Jason Cheney. Based on the books, When the Time Comes, I'll Know, and The Trail of Greed Leads to Black Letter Law by Sally Burns, currently available on Amazon. A link is in the show notes. Starring Jerome St. Jerome as Vern, and Ali Chan as Rima. Original music by Derlis Gonzalez. Edited, sound design, and mixed by John Higgins. If you're enjoying the show, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you're listening, and subscribe now for future episodes.